Hello, world. It's time for a thought experiment. Let's imagine the Cold War went another way. After the Nazis surrendered, the Soviet Union flexed its muscles and asserted its imperial might from Tokyo to Tacoma. Memorials to the fatherland popped up around the globe. This would be the Washington Monument. This could have been your morning commute. And now let's fast forward. These were the first semiconductors. This is your keyboard. This was the first IBM computer. This is Facebook headquarters. This is Silicon Valley. Well, that didn't happen. But in modern Russia, it's easy to get confused. With an extra helping of spycraft, technology here developed a world apart from Silicon Valley. And that didn't change when the Soviet Union collapsed. Twenty-five years later, Russia has copied large parts of the web the rest of us know and love. They built a Russian internet. And with new laws cooked up by the Kremlin and rubber stamped in Moscow, more and more, it's a sovereign internet. Like anything sovereign, it needs walls to protect it. And virtual walls are going up today. To find out exactly how the Russian web works, there was only one thing to do. I had to upload myself. Now that I'm inside, I'll meet a tech oligarch. Travel to Siberia. To dive into a surprising and very remote startup scene. And chase the ever elusive Russian hacker. Using the machine learning, you could create a technology which helped to predict the crime. Let's enter this parallel universe together on this episode of Hello World. Silicon Valley may be home to some of the biggest tech giants in the world, but it's being challenged like never before. Crazy tech geniuses have popped up all over the planet, making things that will blow your mind. My name is Ashley Vance. I'm an author and journalist, and I'm on a quest to find the most innovative tech creations and meet the beautiful freaks behind them. Hello, world. In Moscow over the past decade, the Tsar's gilded churches and monuments to the proletariat have given way to the symbols of modern Russia. Opulent capitalist towers that poke through the clouds. At the heart of this is where I met Dmitry Grishin. Hello, Dmitry. He's the co-founder of Mailru Group and one of only a few people east of Helsinki who can drive me to the office in his own Tesla. I organized the drive for all my employees, like, like 3,000 people, because they want to all to test how accelerate. Dmitry sits atop a Russian tech empire and runs an investment fund for robotics with its roots in Silicon Valley. That doesn't make you want to move there? You have so much going on here. Maybe one day. Never say never, right? Overall, then, do you consider the Russian tech scene competitive? Yes, and, and you know, it's interesting thing that it's very few countries where local players are very strong. And comparing, for example, with China, the internet is fully closed. We have Facebook, Instagram, all kind of uh, Western players, and still uh, pretty successful. So I think we have pretty, pretty, pretty tough uh, competition. Why are Russian engineers so good? I think it's type of education. In Russia, still like mathematics and anything around engineering, they give you very broad, broad view. So if you want to be very creative in, in technology, this is, uh, I think, very good education. 
This, this, this is a guy. This is the office. Yeah. Charging station here. Okay. So everybody knows when you're in the office. Yeah. <laughs> Dimitri's tried to copy Silicon Valley culture here in Moscow, where Mail.ru Group operates two instant messaging networks, a search engine, a price comparison website, and a ton of online games. They also control the three largest Russian social networking sites. The biggest one is VK, a Facebook knockoff. Dimitri and Mail.ru Group took over VK in 2014, after its founder, Pavel Durov, refused to reveal information about Ukrainian activists to the Kremlin. Durov lost his company and now lives in self-imposed exile. Dmitry is also one of the world's biggest investors in robotics. He put $100 million into American firms that produce some familiar faces. What's been the biggest hit of all your robotics companies so uh, far? I, I like all my, my investments, <laughs> I can say. Definitely, I like BB-8 a lot. Also, zip line for the drones, long range delivery, and now they start to do blood delivery in Rwanda. Dimitri ships all kinds of nerd gear to Moscow to try it out and see if he wants to invest. What's the point of the game? We, we should kill robots. <laughs> so good for you. <laughs> As someone who puts all this yeah, money into robots, aren't you? Wow, upset? it's it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> to get a taste of the high life of a tech oligarch, <laughs> Dimitri and I headed for a bite to eat at the tallest restaurant in Europe, 354 meters above the Moscow traffic. Tell me a little bit about your family so, history. So, so uh, yeah, I, I have pretty pretty much engin engineering family, and uh, I, I was born in a city called Kapustin Yar 1. Kapustin Yar was the Soviet Union's answer to Area 51, a top secret city where rocket scientists like Dmitry's grandfather tested ballistic missiles and rockets during the space race. Dmitry grew up programming on computers that plugged into Soviet TVs. But things really took off when he enrolled at Moscow State Technical University in 1995. And the same year, uh, Microsoft announced Windows 95. This famous song from Rolling Stone, Start Me Up. Next two years, I tried to write my own Windows. It's so expensive, Windows. Maybe you can just Make write a cheap. Cheap, cheap version. So I'm sitting, uh, writing it, but after some time, I, I say, oh, OK, no. It's too hard. He might have failed to rewrite the world's most popular operating system. But he did stumble on the copycat business model that became Mail.ru Group. And at the height of the 2001 tech crash, he had to find a way to keep the new company alive with no cash. I became like CEO of the company. And my idea was like, let's try to survive no matter how. We tried to do a lot of tricks. For example, by coming with my car, it was a Lada, Russian, Russian car. We put several servers like physically <laughs> and, and moved them to more cheaper data center. It's hard to imagine now. But in 2004, only 9% of Russians had internet access. What was the Russian government's assessment of the technology industry? They didn't know that they exist. That all changed in 2012. Russia had become the biggest internet market in Europe. Some people used the web to complain about Putin and organize protests against his re-election. The Kremlin responded in full Orwellian glory with a series of laws that allows them to flag opposition sites as extremists and blacklist them. Ever since, it's been hard to tell where the Vlad web begins and ends. I think in the US, the idea is that the Russian government and the tech companies are just intertwined, and that if the government wants to read people's emails, whatever they want to do, they're going to let them do that. If you follow the law, you're okay. Definitely the laws became more complicated. 
right? And sometimes it's definitely the way how to interpret the law. If you have right now laws that government can shut down any service which is uh, not hosting the service inside of the Russia, they can. This is law. Definitely you can have big discussion as this law is good or bad, but this is the only way how to you can operate. Those new laws passed this year would make Edward Snowden weep into his borscht. They demand all sites Russians can access move their servers here, including the Googles and Facebooks of the world. Once on Russian soil, they have to store six months' worth of data about people's every move online, and then give the Kremlin access. Russian companies like Mail.ru protested. They said these measures would take a ridiculous amount of storage space, but they obviously lost. American companies have said there's no way they're moving to Russia. So now they're criminal enterprises here. And that's how you build a sovereign internet. When we grow our business, our concept was that internet was a global system, no border at all. User everywhere can connect to everywhere, data can be migrated, everything. So it really was a global phenomenon. But now I think that fundamental global shift everywhere, that you have country, you have borders, and inside these borders you have different kind of rules, how data is moving, how connectivity is moving, who can connect to what, who can do what. So we're not having like global internet. We're having some kind of some global internet, but uh, a lot of like local internet. And for me, this is a big set uh, in, in terms of change. Just a couple of weeks after we visited Dimitri, he stepped down as CEO of Mail.ru. The government-approved CEO of VK is taking his place. The new guy also happens to be the son of the head of Russia's largest state-run television channel. Coming up next, it's off to Siberia where the Russian government is trying to build a tech utopia in the taiga. This is useful in order to make plasma thrusters for space ships. To find out how Russia makes tech magic happen, all you have to do is hop on a flight from Moscow to Siberia. Yes, that's Siberia. It's not just for gulags anymore. It's hard to wrap your head around just how big Siberia is, and even harder to understand how most people live here. So, to get acquainted, I found another Dimitri. This one, a real natural-born Siberian man to initiate me into the ways of the Russian wilderness. I'm sure it's a good idea, right? <laughs> Perfect idea. <laughs> a trip to the Banya is an ancient, and some would say masochistic, Russian bonding ritual. It consists of three delightful steps. OK, Ashley, Inferno is uh, ready for entrance. Step one, nearly have heat stroke. Step two, shrinkage. <laughs> Step three, get whacked. What does this do? Keep silent, please. Oh. When he's not beating other men with birch branches, my new Russian friend, Dmitri, is a philosophy professor <laughs> here in Akadem Gorodok. That's my destination, a small town hours by plane from Moscow and about 30 minutes outside Russia's third largest city, Novosibirsk. Nikita Khrushchev's government declared 60 years ago that this would be the Siberian home of the Soviet Academy of Sciences built from nothing in the middle of a remote taiga forest that stretches halfway around the planet. Akadem Gorodok, it was the first Soviet technopolis. 
and it was a good opportunity for many young scientists. How has it changed over the last 40 years? In comparison to Soviet time, uh, we have not so much opportunities, uh, but uh, we love our place <laughs> because it's wonderful, uh, 40 institutes, a real scientific community. Do you want a toast? Mm -hmm. What will we toast here? No piety to the enemies of science. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Soaked, swatted, steaming, and having proven my loyalty to science, I was ready to explore Akadem Gorodok. Here, the Soviets hid temples to science in the trees with shrines to match, like this one, to all the mice they sacrificed on the altar of genetic research. Inside the Nuclear Physics Institute, it feels like I walked under the set of Dr. Strangelove. These analog dials, laser contraptions, and miles of metal pipes were all built to push nuclear science to its summit, replicating the sun's power by smashing atoms together. People have been chasing fusion for decades. What's still encouraging and exciting about this field? The, the scientific problem is like a huge mountain and uh, for 60 years, people are trying to get to the top. Everything uh, around the base of the mountain is like a trash dump <laughs> with, with old bodies and stuff. But uh, you can imagine the results you can achieve when you get to the top. Professor Alexei Beklumishev researches something called open trap mechanisms to encourage fusion. In theory, it's a shortcut to the top of the mountain with a smaller load. This is also useful in order to make uh, plasma thrusters for space ships. So you could <laughs> use this to power a spaceship going to Mars? Uh, yeah. Uh, at the moment, it is just an idea. It, it needs a lot of refinement. So this is more of like a 2080 sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> The Soviet government attracted brilliant minds like Alexei's to Siberia with spacious apartments and the kind of prestige they could only get in a town founded as a utopian nerdocracy. But when the Soviet Union fell, so did the walls keeping scientists here. And many of them bolted to work at IBM or MIT or Boeing. For those who stayed, the utopia has lost its luster. Over time, uh, the difference in pay between scientists and, say, bus drivers went in favor of bus drivers. Okay. <laughs> if you are overworked and without pay, you, you want to go elsewhere. Ten years ago, the Russian government decided it needed to hit refresh on the entire town to pull Siberian science out of its post-Soviet slump. They're turning to a new generation of engineers, plucked from the taiga to lead the way. And one of the most successful so far is Dmitry Trubitsyn. Yes, another Dmitry. Today, uh, Akadem Gradok is uh, changing. Now there are not only scientists, but there are also Mm, a lot of companies. More like startups. Yeah, yeah more like startups. Dmitry's company, Tion, started off making king size air filters for hospitals and other businesses. As far as starting a company here, you didn't think, now that I have this idea, I'm going to run off to Silicon Valley. You decided this was the spot where you would give it a go. Well, it's a very comfortable place, and there are a lot of uh, good, smart uh, people here. Also, we have very fresh air here, and it's very it's useful. Company. Yeah, <laughs> it's very useful for our company because we can we can compare the air we produce with the cleanest air in the world. Today, Dmitry is the poster boy for a Siberian startup success story, and he feels like he's close to the finish line on phase one of his vision. Phase two takes him to China, where his company is rapidly expanding. 
There he hopes to get his devices out of hospitals and into homes with this little guy that detects pollutants in the air. You just blow over the top? Or it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Like CO2. You'll feel, feel it. That's enough. Look, it goes down. So the lights are going down. Yeah. It means that air quality is not very good. Now it tried to increase the speed of a fan in breezer in this room to lower the concentration of carbon dioxide. Cool. It seems to work. <laughs> <laughs> Dimitri is not a wholly self-made man. Tion's success belongs to him, but it's built on a blueprint drawn up by the Russian government. His headquarters is on a sprawling government-funded campus called Akadem Park, with this crazy tower in the middle of it. Not recommended if you have a fear of heights. This place is a prime example of one of the big ideas in Russian tech, a cradle-to-grave genius factory. Across the country, they start them young with a strictly uniform education, heavy on math and science. They pull the best out of Siberia and send them down the street to Novosibirsk State University. From there, they used to funnel their brains to places like the Nuclear Institute. But now that that's a bit retro, many of them end up here, in the Tech Tower. Here it's like someone visited a few Silicon Valley startups, punched the copy button, ran it through Google Translate, and then hit paste in the middle of Siberia. Here's the living wall, only here it's dead. Here's the makerspace and the 3D printed Putin. Here's the gym, only it's Siberia, so it comes with bear. Hello, innovation. Case in point, my new friend, Kirill. Where are you from originally? Uh, I was born here in Akadem Gradok. Was your father and mother engineers as well? Yeah, yeah. They graduated from Novosibir State University, and they was a computer engineer, Soviet computer engineer with big uh, computers. OK. <laughs> you can tell by the Terminator-looking device on the table that Kirill makes drones. He says his drone is special because it can take off vertically and then fly very, very far, very, very fast. Kirill sees an Optiplane drone flying miles along high-tension power lines, checking for brakes, or zooming to the site of forest fires and floods across Siberia. A team of engineers barely out of high school and most definitely still in college built this carbon fiber prototype by hand in four months. It's quite a challenge to start a drone startup in Russia because of low constraints, because of investment climate. Traditions of, of, of mind of our clients is not so easy to, to break. This is seen as sort of radical. Yeah, it's kind of radical uh, technology. So, this drone company started in a Russian government-funded incubator is too radical for its clients, who, maybe you guessed it, are part of the Russian government. Optiplane's first contract came from the Russian version of FEMA, and it built this first prototype with money from a government-backed venture capital firm. They wouldn't exist without the government, and they barely exist because of it. Russia is a very centralized country. So the United States, for example, with the state laws, is faster than in Russia. You have to get exceptions to test your drones and, and fly them yeah. around here, and that's difficult to do. Yeah, yeah. So are there many drone companies in Russia? Not so many as in, in <laughs> America. <laughs> it looks really cool. It looks yeah. good, yeah. Like uh, uh, Skynet. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. It's through the sheer force of their engineering smarts and passion that Optiplane has gotten off the ground. Out here in Siberia, they're part of one grand experiment in state-supported innovation. We'll have to see what the next 60 years bring to this silicon forest. Up next on Hello World, I find myself at a party for cyber cops and hit the streets in Moscow 
to shatter what remains of your illusions of personal privacy. I would say that the implications of this very scary. There's never been a better time to take in the epicness of modern Russia. The oil wealth that poured into the country for a decade has remade central Moscow into a classy European capital, only supersized. After all, this is the land of Tchaikovsky and Pushkin, Tolstoy and the Bolshoi. Now it's home to bohemian cocktail bars and some of the best restaurants in the world. The result is something intimidating and, well, romantic. If you come from the West, you can live like an oligarch on the cheap. Sanctions and low oil prices have cut the ruble in half, doubling the fun for outsiders like me. But ask anyone here, and they'll tell you that the tensions with the West won't diminish the Russian soul. Russia's power comes from the force of its intellect. And that's on display here at the Trechikov Gallery, where the country's most iconic modern artists hang from the walls. It got me thinking, what is art really? An object? An idea? A Jungian expression of a superpersonal alien impulse that creativity imposes on its creator? Oh, this one's swirly. I wonder what this app does. This app gets five stars for sure. It's called Prisma, and its creator, Alexei Moisenkov, uses machine learning magic to rebuild your photos into something that could hang in a museum. This painting is done by Alexander Exter. Does it look like one of your filters? Yeah, it's similar to a Gothic filter in our app. What would Prisma pick up on? Yeah, so for example, like finding the right colors, finding the right shapes, for example, these circles, and then it, it will try to find the right structure in your photo and redraw it from scratch. Prisma topped 2 million downloads a day earlier this year. They program a vast network of computers to study great artists and then repaint your pictures from a blank canvas. Compared to that, Instagram filters are weak sauce. They just tweak the color and exposure of your photos. How do you train a neural net to do something like that? You, you need only one starlight picture. So you take like a Picasso and then... And then a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, simple photos and then use Picasso to transfer the Picasso style to these details. These past few years, Russia has honed the art of turning computer science nerds into AI building geniuses. To put another foot soldier in that AI army to the test, I went right across the street from the Tretyakov Gallery to one of Moscow's spectacular public spaces, Gorky Park. Just five years ago, this was a decaying Soviet relic. Today, it's buzzing with people on wheels, and friendly Russian faces. And my goal here is to find a few. Hi. Would you mind if I take a photo of your face? I'm trying to do a little bit of an experiment. Can I take a photo of your face? I just take a photo of you, and then it's see, we see if it can find your VK profile. Okay. You might find me on Facebook. It doesn't work on Facebook yet, because they don't let you search the database. Find Face is an Android app that lets you take a picture of a new friend or a complete stranger. In a few seconds, it scans all 250 million photos from VK, the Russian Facebook knockoff, and then finds a match. 
All right, let's see what happens. Moment of truth. Here we go. Oh, oh it's there. me. It's <laughs> Oh, it's me. You. Yes, it's me. And your hair is so different in the photo. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely find me first. Yeah. So it works. Yeah. It's really cool. Do you think it's strange? It's strange, but cool. You like some girl and you take a photo and you can find her and text her or something. Yeah, so you, you guys like it. <laughs> I would <laughs> <be> like this. <laughs> so if I forgot if this is my son or not, I can be check it yeah, with my phone. Find him. <laughs> okay. This year, Find Face took its algorithm to America for something called the Mega Face Challenge. There it beat Google and a lot of other face spotting software. To find out how they did it. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I went to meet the algorithm's creator at the office of his company, Entech. Do you mind showing me how the technology works a little bit? Yeah. Can we try me? So these are my Russian brethren, my cousins. <laughs> Is it ranked in order by who they think looks the most like yes. me? This is like a 60-year-old with a machine gun. <laughs> Another guy with a gun. I want to show you something else. Why am I a bear? <laughs> <laughs> so the similarity is very low. But yes, the algorithm thinks that there are some, some similarity. Sometimes it's difficult to say why neural network works this way, but, but it works. <laughs> Artyom programmed a neural network that approaches face finding differently than others. He fed it thousands of image matches. And after about six months of training, voila, it learned to read faces. Essentially, you don't even know what the neural network is seeing. In the beginning, the uh, neural network gives random answers, and the accuracy is close to zero. And during training, if everything goes well, the accuracy grows. Uh, and they also call neurons. Some combinations of these neurons are responsible for race. Some combinations are responsible for type of eyes. If you can efficiently find the exact person among huge data sets, it opens a lot more interesting use cases. Like, for example, you can search for criminals in real life among uh, all the street cameras in the city. Are we creeped out yet? Maybe we should be. Entech has already signed a contract with the Moscow City Police, though Artyom won't talk about it. And he says they already have agreements with other law enforcement agencies, both inside and outside Russia. It's easy to imagine what the FBI or its Russian counterpart, the FSB, could do with this kind of technology. So it's a little bit controversial, right? Because anyone can identify you now yeah. out of the crowd. I would say that the implications of this are very scary. I think FSB is well, searching I'm, us right there. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm <laughs> saying like companies, yeah, big companies, corporations, and governments definitely know everything about you. But yeah. for random people, this makes it much easier. You have to be careful if you go outside in the street or in a Facebook or any other social network. You've done it. Yep. You're open to, to be recognized. This idea that you're not anonymous when you walk the street anymore, somebody can just snap your photo and identify who you are. You must have thought about that when you were developing the technology. When we were uh, developing, we were thinking only about accuracy and how, how cool it is. But <laughs> <laughs> privacy finished when you have uh, smartphones with you because they can track all the information about you. It's a battle between technology and privacy. My personal guess that <laughs> technology will win. On the outskirts of Moscow, you'll find Skolkova. This is the mothership of state-sponsored innovation. The Kremlin is coaxing companies and workers here with promises of government support. I came here to take in its hugeness and to meet one of Skolkova's rising stars, a criminologist named Ilya Sachkov. Hello, Ilya. <laughs> Hi. How are you? I'm good. Nice to see nice you. Nice to see you. Yeah. 
Ilya heads Group IB, a private company based in Moscow that tries to find ever-elusive Russian hackers, unmask them, and then hand them over to the authorities. We, something like the superheroes in our field, we help our clients to solve very, very difficult cases. We use the branding like FBI. Look at your picture, man. You look like James Bond. Uh, this is Photoshop. <laughs> Group IB specializes in investigating fraud and theft, the type of stuff that makes up 99% of cybercrime. People look on the cybercrime like an iceberg. They could see only the upper thing, but underwater, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of politicians, a lot of corrupt people from the different organization, and this is the future. They walk a tightrope cooperating with Russian law enforcement, while also serving major international clients like Citibank and Microsoft. You have foreign clients today, huge companies, but as the tensions between China and the US and Russia, they just seem to be escalating, especially when it comes to cybersecurity. Actually, we had office in New York. It was really funny experience because every week we have had excursion from FBI, from the New York police. They asked, what are you doing here? <laughs> it just seems like that will make it so much harder for you guys to expand your Why? business. I think um, with our knowledge that we really have good understanding of Russia cyber crime. So I think this is competitive uh, advantage. But do you think with the tensions between the US and Russia right now that Russia would be upset if you had an office in Silicon Valley? Uh, I think yes. We have some toxic knowledge about the organized crime and cyber crime. And I think it's not the government, it's some people in government. Private company without any control do investigations, uh, get some knowledge, uh, of course they are not happy. You think of hackers as these guys sitting in their basement with their hats and their hoodies on. Well, this is what the people look like who hunt them. This is Russia's largest cybercrime event. One thousand people today. The face recognition company that you told me about. They, they are there? Yes, on the second floor. They won the face recognition uh, competition by Google. And how do you think the future is going to change? The most important problem that the human being will face in the future is the Ilya started Group IB in college with a few buddies. One of them is Dmitry Volkov, the company's head hacker hunter. So now they will focus on the resources of recruiting to find people who are able to perform self-directed attacks and will do these things. And here there will not be a goal of espionage, there will not be a goal of the case of acts of aggression. Here the goal of zero-mushers is one, is to take the maximum damage to the human beings and the maximum information of information. I visited Group IB's Moscow office to find out more about how Dmitry chases cyber criminals. Is the Russian hacking community, is that the, the biggest cyber crime community in the world? We're different, so Russian-speaking hackers are so famous because we share knowledge, we develop tools, we share information about how to attack banks, uh, how security measures applied on different systems. So a huge amount of information uh, is available on the ground community. What's the art of that and the, the technique? Main goal is to get uh, the full history of hacker's activity because when hacker starts, he do a lot of mistakes. 
we have more than 100,000 profiles about uh, hackers who communicated on the Russian-speaking underground community. It is fully automated. We have artificial intelligence implementing the security solutions. We have special algorithms to detect unknown programs. And it's always interesting to see and, of course, to track uh, how hackers adopt their techniques and tools to do attacks. What does a Russian hacker look like? Who are these people? If he's an attacker who is doing just technical job, usually he lives alone. But if we talk about organizers of fraudulent schemes, usually we, these people are very rich. Uh, we don't wear hoods, uh, we drive in good cars, live in good houses, uh, have very beautiful women. I can say it's like a mafia. Group IB now occupies an uncomfortable position at the intersection of Cold War geopolitics and organized crime, like the mafia from Russia's unruly Caucasus. During an early Group IB investigation, Ilya learned that one of their targets had ordered the mobsters to kill him. If you know about the uh, Caucasian organized group, it's not funny at all. And do you have bodyguards? I had bodyguards for two years. But I, didn't, I, I understand if someone would like to do something bad, uh, they will do. Это автомат Калашникова. Это опасное оружие, но оно не такое опасное, как, например, ядерное оружие. После того, как произошел Карибский кризис, страны между собой, поняв, что они находятся перед большой катастрофой, сумели договориться контролировать ядерное оружие. Общество пока не понимает, что кибертеррористы могут использовать компьютерное оружие за одну секунду через территорию другой страны, что приведет, естественно, к катастрофе. Катастрофа, которая изменит нашу планету. Что должно произойти, чтобы страны договорились и придумали единый инструмент борьбы с компьютерными преступлениями? И это то, что общество может спасти. Peace on Cyber Earth may come. But just in case, Russia is building a series of startup cities to increase the might and reach of its sovereign tech. To an outsider like me, the depth of Russia's state influence on companies feels flat out backward and wrong. It's hard to imagine a true tech utopia springing up in a place like this. Edward Snowden, yes, he's somewhere out there, would say the US has its eyes everywhere too. Whether you're on this internet or that one, you're never alone anymore. Up next on Hello World, I travel to Chile's Atacama Desert to go hunting for the origins of the universe and find myself with the help of a shaman and some low-tech frog poison. <laughs>